I wrote this lecture once when the Trump phenomenon seemed to have settled in as the half-life of American democracy. Entropy and decay, much of it highly toxic, with a doomed fraction of the original substance still remaining. I wrote it again when the COVID virus took the future out of the hands of the economists and ideologues and privateers, out of all our hands, until it reconstellates itself, possibly for the better. Then I wrote the lecture again, considering what in our thinking and our cultural habitus might lead us to waste the good possibilities that should come with this hiatus, might lead us to return to the sins and crimes that have plagued our history. Merriam-Webster defines habitus as physical constitution, quote, especially as related to predisposition to disease. So the word is useful here. I found an interesting example in this morning's New York Times. It seems that remarkably wealthy hospital chains have received billions of dollars in federal payouts while laying off, furloughing, or cutting the pay of tens of thousands of staff, doctors, and nurses, as well as cafeteria workers, janitors, and cleaners. We were told to fear that the healthcare system would be overwhelmed, and here there were massive layoffs. Maybe administrators don't take the Hippocratic Oath, but this does, does look to me like doing harm. They also fail to provide adequate protective gear to remaining staff, no surprise. At the same time, the CEOs were receiving their usual stupendous emoluments. I'm not sure what a CEO actually does. I'd have assumed he or she would have been intent on keeping hospitals clean, well-equipped and staffed, but this would seem not to be the case. A conscientious cleaner saves lives, unless of course she herself contracts the virus and dies, or she is deprived of her honorable work on budgetary grounds. Who doesn't know the consequences of poverty for those who are trapped in it? Should the practice of exploiting them be met with anything but contempt, disgust? Here we have the great mystery of polarization laid bare. Shame would have imposed some limits on it, but in the absence of shame, we must look to legislation, hoping that actually meaningful law will actually be enforced. It is in economic arrangements like this that racism really lives. The thing that struck me, considering the issues of racism and injustice that had filled the times for weeks, was that this very solid article did not mention the importance of the kind of thing it describes to perpetuating the injustice, which is also reflected in it. If the people affected by all this were arrayed along a spectrum on the basis of their skin tone, one extreme would be people of color, while those at the other extreme would be preponderantly white, since CEOs are preponderantly white. These executives are immunized against the consequences of the economy, to the economy of the pandemic they are supposed to be fighting by huge infusions of public money, which they have used in ways that are clearly harmful to the economy. Would this be tolerated if we were not so thoroughly accustomed to seeing wealth flow toward the wealthy and away from the poor? Poverty segregates, incarcerates, kills. The proper response to it is not philanthropy or socialism, but plain fairness, an honest acknowledgement of the value of the work they do, their and their children's potential, their well being. Now, that is on Tuesday, the 9th of June in the morning, having read and considered the news, I am writing this preface in the solemnest hope that the popular rising that has taken over the streets is the opening of a new era another future than I could have foreseen when I wrote in April and May. The massiveness of it, the good heartedness, leads me to hope that a new national and personal ethic might arise that would make those who are in a position to cheat the vulnerable ashamed to do it. Allowing as one must for all the bad faith and backsliding that have betrayed the best hopes of other generations, certain good and important things are demonstrated in this vast collective movement. One is that displays of force do not establish authority. 
Within limits, they may establish control, which is a very different thing. The present government has lost authority in part because it, was brought, it, be, it has brought inappropriate force to bear, literally in attempting to occupy the streets of Washington, and less graphically, in attacking and removing people in government who express independent thinking or draw on unwelcome expertise. These chanting crowds who pass through the streets of America for all the world as if they owned the place, who pass into national consciousness and history like the free people of, of Walt Whitman's epic visions seem miraculous to me. So did the chanting crowds of the 60s and 70s, which I remember very well. There are bitter memories, the decline of much of that movement into its opposite, with the assist of a shift among activists away from social responsibility and to self-care, which has persisted as a vast range of high-end goods and services. This may actually have become as lasting a change in American life as any other that emerged from that period and may account in some part for stark class differences in health and life expectancy made so vivid by the pandemic. Painful lessons are as useful as any other kind, as all the prophets would agree, and we have given ourselves and our fellow citizens a great many of them to draw from. Nevertheless, <clears throat> there is one ultimate, fully legitimate authority in this country, and that is the people. It has been noted globally that we have an incompetent central government, impeached but still possessed of more power than legitimately belongs to the presidency hemorrhaging the influence the country has asserted in the world at large, backstopped by a Senate that does not pretend to deliberate, and a vice president who offers no prospect of improvement were the president to be removed. I listen to a gospel song that ponders the biblical phrase even now. When there seems to be no hope, something amazing can happen. Even now we can see the government of, by, and for the people passing through the streets all over the country. That they are seen as a force for change and justice is indicated in the reforms of police departments, the decline in the fortunes of Robert E. Lee and his horse, the shifting of the earth under Liberty University, and so on. Um, that this heightened public attention is a sword that can turn every way. Changes are being um, undertaken so rapidly, it is indeed as though the authority had suddenly arrived on the scene, ending years of drift and decline. In, it is the case that the demonstrations tend more and more to have the quality of block parties, festivals that celebrate an informal consensus that it is an excellent thing to be together enjoying a shared interest in achieving and sustaining justice and peace. A little joy is certainly forgivable in the circumstances. Things may change as we succumb to habitus or to a, effective polemical attacks, exploiting ugly old fears, interests, and, and, and resentments. Or they may express a great national relief, too broad and deep for words, at putting aside fear and resentment and reclaiming hope is something this country can still justify. Here I, begin an, <clears throat> here I begin an earlier version of the lecture, which is not irrelevant or outdated, sadly enough, though it has seemed to be overshadowed by other events. Surely no one with even a slight theological bent can consider the present state of the world, its encounter with pandemic, without thinking long thoughts, solemn thoughts. This virus is an abrupt instruction in the fact that all our intelligence, all our knowledge can seem futile against a new challenge. What is a virus after all? It seems not even to have life and yet it is brilliantly suited to cohabiting with life, to exploit or destroy it, to make itself integral to it. Things can be said about viruses but the entity itself is a microscopic black box. We have known all this for a very long time, of course, and have put aside the fact of the unknowable in favor of the preventions and mitigations that have so far helped contain it. Now the unknowable is active among us, revealing a glimpse of what is potential in it to our profound astonishment. 
Could anything be better suited to bringing all the making and risking and wrecking that is a day in the life of this planet to a halt than this virus? Our recent instruction in humility obliges me to say yes, no doubt, and to attach no meaning at all to the fact that I cannot imagine what it would be. Who would have guessed in the years from Democritus to Einstein that the atom contained Armageddon? We act on reality and we don't know what we're dealing with. I am a retired English professor with an interest in biblical prophecy as a genre. This puts me at a very far remove from the fiery visionaries whose passions and urgencies, urgencies still make the Old Testament seem a little hot to the touch. But this is a moment when we might be able to give this daunting liter literature a hearing. The great Hebrew prophets told their people that in, even, in every disaster there is justice, therefore meaning. It had to have taken as much courage to hear this as it took them for them to say it. A prophet would probably tell us now, you have toyed with the worst possibilities, conjured with the unfathomable. Now it confronts you. Call it an act of God. It is not as terrible as your worst intentions, probably. Though we, ha um, though we have not seen the last of it yet. We have talked endlessly about all the ways we threaten the planet. I think now we may have begun to suspect that we have wandered beyond the limits of, every, of even apparent human competence. We have not been without guidance. In the 25th chapter of Leviticus, God speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai says, when you come into the land which I give you, the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. In the seventh day, there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land. In the 26th chapter, after a warning of appalling devastation, God says, then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate. As long as it lies desolate, it shall have a rest, the rest it had not in your Sabbaths when you dwelt on it. The Sabbath laws altogether would have inhibited our tendency to exploit everything and everyone, including ourselves, to the point of true exhaustion and abuse. Now we have seen the great cities of the world stunned and silenced. Whether des desolated, time will tell. We have seen how ready the wild creatures are to enjoy the Sabbath that has been enforced on us and bestowed on them. This remarkable experience, a total and lingering eclipse of human expectations may never have occurred before in the whole cataclysmic history of earth. The fall of Rome to the barbarians might bear comparison. By these terrible standards, what the world has experienced can seem gradual, a word of warning, or it is something entirely different from this, a moment in which we act on our deepest values in which we pass judgment on ourselves. God help us all. It has been characteristic of, of Americans for a couple of generations that if they can find someone to blame for anything, they feel they have immunized themselves against responsibility for persisting in the very offenses they denounce, usually decisively committed by parents or cultural ancestors. A sufficient loyalty to higher values is signified by these denunciations. Despite any superficial resemblance, all this differs absolutely from the effect of the people can be confidently assumed to know nothing or nothing true, are regularly put to use, made scapegoats, with the difference that the animal in question, the biblical goat, was meant to carry away the sins of the community. We single out the dead who cannot carry anything anywhere, but who are always available to be deplored. The Puritans did certainly believe in original sin, but it did not prevent them from taking their own sins very seriously. This may be the only part of the caricature that has a basis in fact. There is a kind of collective poor us implicit in, in the ritual blaming we indulge in a kind of notice to the world not to expect too much of us, individually or collectively, blamed as we are by the crimes of Andrew Jackson. In real time, in our time, Native American people are struggling with the pande pandemic and everything that predisposes a community to vulnerability to it. We can blame General Custer. 
our descendants will have excellent grounds for blending us. Can art stand in the place of moral and ethical thought? I don't know who came up with the saw that slavery is America's original sin, but before we internalize it too deeply, we might reflect on the fact that original sin is universal and inescapable, an essential fact of human experience. But when in these terms blame is projected back on that initial moment in our history, when Dutch and British agents of colonialism brought their human cargoes to these shores, as they had to many others before, the narrative blurs. There were no Americans then, as we've come to understand the word. There were the Indian nations, who seemed to have looked on at these early European incursions from a distance. The whites who were there were convicts and paupers, largely powerless and brutalized laborers to judge by the laws that were written to control them. The later colonies founded as havens for religious dissenters, New England, Pennsylvania, Maryland, were by no means typical here or anywhere. Americans seem to share an assumption that blame ends at the water's edge, which is just as well, since the impulse to blame is a sort of Ariadne's thread leading back to the dawn of humankind. If we were to blame the British, just a thought experiment, we would find ourselves pondering an early and violent globalization of the world economy that would raise doubts about the wisdom of what has been the great tendency toward globalism in our time. For almost half our history, we were a disorganized string of colonies who had finally to fight a war, in fact, two wars, to be able to determine our own policies and laws. Then too, the population was in most places majority Anglo-European, therefore participants in attitudes and practices characteristic of that civilization. There is every reason to look for origins of the Cherokee removal in the Scots clearances, the expulsions of an undesired population which did so much to populate North America. This is not to place blame. It is only to say that precedent can make decisions available that decency would forbid. Our original sin goes back to Adam. Resituating this event in American historical time does not make it a useful beginning place for a confrontation with injustice, with intimidation, violence, exploitation, the denial of rights, all of which are moral or criminal offenses available to being addressed by the political system, the justice system. I know the justice system is a big part of the problem, but this is not an excuse. We are to blame for the failures and cruelties of our own institutions. Invoking Judeo-Christian mythopoiesis in this context only dignifies rot and corruption. It does not even gesture at moral clarity, quite the opposite, and it does not suggest the intent, indeed the possibility of reform. Perhaps the expression means only that captive Africans were brought to these shores by the British and Dutch at the same time they also dumped white undesirables to be set to the kind of forced labor that made colonies so profitable for investors in England and Europe. Then yes, slavery was introduced here in that very local minute one. It seems necessary in some settings to mention that it was by no means invented here and that American slavery in the beginning was the sin committed by the old world against Africa and against the new world as well. And to further empire, they also sinned against their own poor and hapless, the wretched refuse of their teeming shores. So we should set aside whatever moral satisfactions come with deploring this Adamic moment, which seems to me to imagine Adam, the universal human, as white, since those Africans were certainly as guiltless in the matter as are their descendants. <clears throat> I may be worrying too much about an expression that is merely ill-considered. I would be readier to grant this if the flaws in the thinking behind it did not closely resemble the flaws in our worst thinking, our cynicism and tacit resignation. Human fallibility is incurably part of the order of things, but murder is murder and should be identified, deplored and punished our black citizens have been cheated of justice, of their liberty, their tranquility, their families and their lives. There is nothing inevitable about this. There are laws to deal with the crimes committed against them. 
There are laws to punish the abuse of law now in real time. I believe we have done this to ourselves over the last century or so, have learned to find satisfaction in laying blame for our transgressions to the charge of the safely dead as our part in the attempt, polemical in most cases, to use historical and cultural factors to supposedly explain individual character or to use important individuals to describe and account for the characteristics of a particular culture or ethnicity, as Moses in the case of Jews or Calvin in the case of Americans. Our embrace of, cap of iron cage capitalism, of Weber, has let us hate what we also accept as our character and destiny. It is as if our thinking finds rest and, and fulfillment in perfect futility. Be that as it may, Weber has fused the name of Calvin with the tormented, trivialized, inhumane cultural circumstances Weber invokes. He was actually writing about an influential religious minority in Germany, but Americans never willingly share the spotlight, so for our purposes, it was all about us. So we are called rational, materialist, and full of anxiety, courtesy of the metaphysics of 16th century French humanists. We may have told ourselves that these things are true so often that they have been allowed to become true. In the degree they describe us, it is terrible to consider what we are, that we are entering a time when we will be called upon to respond to much need, much grief and disillusionment. Here is a description in Calvin's sermons on Titus of God in relation to the poor, quote, there is a poor soul which is rejected of all men. Scarcely will any man bid him good morrow. To him doth God come first and tells him that he is his father and will have him to hear him. And he tarrieth with him and saith, thou art of my flock. Let my word be thy food. Let, be, let it be the spiritual life of thy soul. Seeing then that God hath himself so graciously toward Pardon me. Seeing then that God hath showed himself so graciously towards mankind, that he hath, as it were, taken those into his lap, which were held scorn of, and so little set by that men vouchsafe not to give them a good look, and showeth himself a father to them, and adopted them to be his children. Must it not be that there is a horrible hard-heartedness in us, if we be not humbled, made gracious by the declaring of such goodness of our God? It is a commonplace that Calvin is very intent on the grandeur of God. This is true. If some find it impossible to reconcile grandeur with this beautiful tenderness, the problem does not lie with Calvin. Horrible hard-heartedness, a potent phrase. This will be a temptation as the consequences of the, of, uh, the health and economic crises that are now looming become clear. I devoutly hope to die before this country brings such disgrace down on itself. Already we are failing to care for our hungry children. And lest an, lest an exculpation of Calvin should lead us to train our indignation on Adam Smith, we should practice saying, we closed our eyes, I closed my hand. For better or worse, Calvin has lain in his unmarked grave since 1564, it is time for us to accept responsibility for ourselves. It is remarkable, very impressive, that Israel loved and preserved the prophetic literature, placing it beside the law of Moses, when the consistent message of these books is that the people to whom they were addressed had themselves to blame for the catastrophes that befell them. Better, they accepted the fact that blame was attempting evasion, a reduction and simplification, in effect a denial of the meaning of calamity. The God of Israel whistled for the fearsome Assyrians. What an astonishing thing to say. He brought them down on his own people to instruct them and the world through them in the fact that what we do as individuals and as societies really matters. It is of an order of importance that cannot be accommodated by even the gravest casuistries of who did what to whom. 
This would seem a drastic response to the usual provocations, human injustice, if the lesson were ever learned. No doubt there is a great error in assuming that God regards injustice as lightly as even the most tender-minded among us do or have done. The prophets describe an agony expressed in earthly terms, which we call wrath, but which might as well be called the passion of grief. Only suppose Calvin was right, that God does indeed love the, the least of us with the fullness and richness of fatherly love, with the warmth of embrace of parent and child, that potent and homely comfort of the parent as well as the child. We know from another more authoritative source that the, latest, that the least of these is in fact God's son and that our encounters with him are noted and have consequences at the scale of divine reality. It is again remarkable that the vision that emerges out of these great agons is one of peace. They shall neither kill nor destroy. Justice will flow down like a river. We should have been far more attentive to the fact that justice has always been a condition for peace. Put in earthly terms, both seem attainable. But here we are, killing and destroying, cheating and exploiting, for all the world as if Jerusalem had never suffered for our sins. To a prophet, it might have appeared that this great adversary, this pandemic, is a mighty answer to the reality we have made. God knows we have studied war. War has kept pace with our most brilliant science. By we, I mean every society capable of the work. Brilliance emerges at random in any population. War is a secretive study, so the generality of people never have anything like a complete understanding of the ways we threaten ourselves. Should we decide sometime that the coronavirus came from a laboratory somewhere, we can settle down to a long argument about which government or private interest sponsored the research, never confident that our list of possible culprits is complete. Insofar as laying blame means identifying the source of a problem, the question is effectively moot in this important instance. Every competitor, every competitor that drove the perfecting of the weapon, the ethos or worldview that supported the competition collectively as a signature activity of humankind, these are all culpable. A contemporary prophet would not, I believe, blame the Russians or Chinese or the Nazis or the military industrial complex or Lord Jeffrey Amherst. He would say that we individuals and communities have failed in our humanity, had failed to do justice and love mercy. And so we have become so hardened that we are able to imagine varieties of violence that will utterly pre preclude justice and mercy. Ezekiel chastens his people by invoking a famous, famous disaster, a perished city. What was her crime? Quote, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, surfeit of food and prosperous ease, but they did not aid the poor and needy. Ezekiel 1649, Revised Standard Version. This verse occurs in a context that does, that does also suggest unspecified transgressions of the kind conventionally called decadence. But when Ezekiel raises a question generally treated as settled, what was the guilt of that notorious city? He answers, she did not help the poor. I'm proposing here that those things we are inclined to think of as sins or crimes have pervasive day-to-day -day inhumanity at their root. To feed the hungry and clothe the naked is the one great behest. Righteousness in the absence of these gentle, ideally these loving attentions to others is not to be hoped for. Justice would require us to remove every obstacle, every policy that would make them poor. In the prophetic writings, judgment descends on societies as a whole on Sodom, on Babylon, on Israel. There are questions. Why should disasters befall those who have been the victims of greed and misrule together with those who have been guilty of these offenses? I have no answer to suggest. 
But the point is made insistently that the ethics demanded of communities are the same as those demanded of individuals. Indeed, they are a single fabric. They can be summarized in the word justice, which is realized in the actions of individuals or not at all. There is nothing simple about the relationship between the individual and the community. Most of us have a set of standards higher than we choose at least to see in the society around us, but we don't want to appear fastidious. For most purposes, we reckon our moral adequacy against the norms that appear to us to prevail, aspiring to a solid C plus. Or much worse, we imagine the generality of people to be far inferior to ourselves, which is itself a grave injustice, predisposing to the ethical license we see in certain public moralists. To put the matter simply, the love of justice cannot be a sentiment only. It must be accepted, first of all, as a discipline, a personal ethic. I began this talk pondering the atom, that infinitesimal something or other that contains an imaginable power and the virus, the almost nothing that has brought the world to a crawl with the potency and complexity of its impact. We, all, we act on reality and we hardly know what it is. Then again, the inwardness of any human being, which our traditions tell us sustains the interest of God Almighty. However trifling, however easily dismissed it may seem to us. It is the reality in the light of which we must try to understand the word justice and try as well to imagine true and meaningful peace. Justice would try to show respect where it is due, that is, to the complexity and mystery of any life. And justice, if it is more than pretense, would act on this respect. The prophets describe the overwhelming consequences that erupt in response to abuses that may seem almost negligible at the time. Pervasive, yes, because they are customary. One might say systemic. If we imagine God's tenderness toward any ordinary life, and then the abrasions that are offered to it, maliciously or unthinkingly, we must also imagine consequences proportional to the reality of the offense and to the fact that it is carried out with the implied consent of society, again, systemically. We can also define justice by its absence. Where justice is lacking, people might feel that they are not at home in their own country that their safety and the safety of their children is not to be assumed, that their work will not be valued at its worth, that they cannot offer their children more than guarded hope, that they cannot trust that simple, that they, pardon me, that they cannot trust the simple contact with others will be free of insult, whether intended or merely systemic. Where justice is lacking, there is an unholy alliance of societal norms with the slackened consciences of those who create, embody, and perpetuate these norms. The prophets would tell us that there is inconceivably great importance in acting well in this holy theater of human interaction. They all say repent, they all say do justice. I have never in my life before felt, as I do now, that this vast country might be attempting, overwhelmingly and in all humility, to find its way to a fuller realization of its best ideals. There is a habit of cynicism among many people who consider themselves enlightened, who sympathizing with all that is just and right, believe all the same that there is a baseline of reality, a baseline reality of mediocrity and self-interest, lamentable but natural to the country that will com compromise or defeat this great awakening. This is the kind of prophecy that substantially increases the likelihood of its own fulfillment by marginalizing idealism and normalizing despair. And then there are the people in whom we have always claimed to place our hope.